uh, had a tremendously vested interest in making sure that that Ethan Couch was brought to justice. Felt like at the time that the court system did not adequately uh, access assess any punishment or, or adequate punishment at least and so when he uh, then disappeared obviously people in this agency who had to work that crime scene and deal with the victim's families and do everything they did took it very personally so it was a very high priority for us to uh, make sure that we found him and got him back uh, and uh, we're very hopeful that very soon that's going to happen and he'll be back he'll be back here but the first thing I need to do is express the great amount of appreciation I have, not only for the marshal's office, uh, but Rick's people have just gone above and beyond in this case for us to, to, to help locate uh, uh, Ethan and his mom. The DA's office has played, a, as always, a pivotal role in that. Uh, the marshal's fugitive task force that works out of this area, both the district attorney, the marshal, and our agency all have uh, people assigned to that task force. They have worked tirelessly almost around the clock on this since uh, since the disappearance of, of, of Ethan and his mom. So all of those people, not to mention police agencies across the state and across the country, every lead we had that we needed followed up somewhere else, we contacted a police agency and they took care of it for us. Everyone's been tremendously cooperative. Uh, understand that there's a lot of things that you're going to want to know and ask about that we still are not going to be able to talk about because of the ongoing investigation part of this and the fact that we still are trying to get uh, Ethan and Tanya back on U.S. soil and that is, 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 is very important that we don't say anything or do anything that will, that will prohibit that from happening or derail that. We're on schedule to do that, we hope so. Um, as I said early on, uh, there was a strong feeling on many people's part, mine particularly, that they had fled the country uh, once that we found out they were missing and uh, you know obviously it was proven correct. Uh, we worked a tremendous amount of leads as I said we um, we followed leads both locally statewide in the country but then kept getting information that they were probably out of the country and eventually got some intelligence information that was very valuable that they had probably driven the pickup truck that we put out at the last news conference, the information for people to look for, got some intelligence, they'd probably driven that to the border and then crossed over the border and were perhaps still in that truck. Um, continued to gather information both locally in a way and learn through uh, some interviews that what we suspected all along had happened, that they had planned to disappear, that um, they even had something that was almost akin to a going away party before they before they left town. Uh, our suspicion that his mother was assisting him and helping him has, has, has proven true, we believe. And so uh, we followed those leads and eventually uh, led to uh, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, where they were taken into custody. Um, the information really kind of turned on um, Christmas Eve is about the time that I think that, that the really kind of concrete information uh, came in and they were able to to uh, really concentrate on, on the area down there where they were eventually located. The problem with it was, as you can imagine, Port of Art at Christmas time, tremendous amount of tourists down there, so American uh, people were prevalent everywhere and they weren't going to, it wouldn't be somewhere they would stick out. They were. They were, they were wise to go into that kind of area, but you know, what, what I think we can all classify as really good police work, found out where they were staying and where they were located, and we were, uh, they were able to take them into custody. Uh, the Mexican authorities have them in custody as we speak. We are working, the marshals are working to get them back here to the states, at which point uh, Ethan will be taken into custody and put in our juvenile facility here in Tarrant County for a hearing there in front of a juvenile judge. And we have now uh, had a, an arrest warrant issued for Tanya Couch for a hindering and apprehension. So she will be arrested uh, and brought to our jail upon, uh, upon arrival back, back in the States. Um, again, they are still officially in the custody of the Mexican government right now. 
uh, some of these things that, that are questions you're going to have, we're just going to have to wait and not answer. And some of the things that I've been asked over the last 24 hours are stuff that we're just not going to be able to talk about. And please understand that we're not trying to, to withhold information, but a lot of people assisted in finding these people and those people deserve to be protected what they told us and they will be protected as far as we're concerned so a lot of the information that came to us we're not going to be able to talk about how we got the information we're not going to be able to talk about how we learned what we learned and we're certainly not going to talk about the investigative technique that we got them that they used to get them into custody uh, as I said I think it was really really good police work more more than anything else uh, we're excited that that uh, we have them back in custody. To be honest with you, we're going to breathe a lot easier when they're back in this country and we have them locked up here in Tarrant County, and that's the ultimate goal. So that's where we're headed. That's where we are. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Taylor, and then we'll be back up to answer questions. Thank you, Sheriff. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Well, after uh, 11 days of the U.S. Marshal Service tracking down uh, Ethan Couch. Uh, we can finally say he's in custody. Um, he was arrested last night by uh, Mexican authorities down in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Um, I'd echo with what the sheriff said, the, you know, the working relationship that we have together here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in the Northern District of Texas through our task force. Uh, as he said, one of his officers is assigned to the task force as well as the district attorney's office. And we enjoy that relationship. It's really the collaboration of the federal uh, law enforcement, state and locals that really brings you know, fugitives to justice. Um, and really this was nothing more than a textbook case of that. Um, it, the, the collaboration among all the officers, the tirelessness, the dedication, the perseverance, the passion that they, these officers have in, in tracking down fugitives, that's why we're successful. It's because of that and it's because of the people. And it also spans internationally too as we um, pursue fugitives in foreign countries. We have a great relationship with our Mexican counterparts uh, down there, and, uh, and they, they help us out a lot, and we also help them out as well, and that also carries to other countries uh, as well. Um, we still don't know have a lot of details yet about uh, his return, and as well as the mother. Uh, we're still working through that with uh, the Mexican government, but uh, rest to be sure that we are very happy and pleased that uh, they are in the uh, custody of the Mexican authorities and they'll be returned to the United States here shortly. Well, I, I also want to express my gratitude to especially the U.S. Marshal Service for their assistance in getting the return of Ethan Couch and his mother. Clearly, without their assistance, we would not have him at this time. We're very grateful to the Marshal Service as well as to the Sheriff's Department for their work on this case. Um, when he is returned along with his mother, we expect the mother to be charged with hindering apprehension in Texas law, and then we expect to begin proceedings with Ethan Couch. As you know, there's already hearings set on January the 19th to transfer his juvenile probation to the adult system. We are bound by the sentence that he received from the juvenile court, which was a 10-year probated sentence. Those, uh, that, that sentence can be revoked. It is an anomaly of Texas law that if we revoke his juvenile sentence, he would stay in a juvenile facility until his 19th birthday, which is April the 11th of next year, 2016. So if we proceed in the juvenile sentence, his maximum sentence that he will receive is four, four months of confinement. That, in my opinion, is not a sufficient punishment for the taking of four lives. Our request of the court is going to be to transfer his probation to the adult court and deal with him in the adult system where we no longer have to be concerned about the best interest of the child, the child defendant in this case. So that's our plan going forward. Um, and let me again thank the public for their assistance in capturing Ethan, Ethan Couch because we got um, our officers, the Sheriff's Office, the Marshal Service received um, information from throughout the United States and foreign countries about the location of that, the vehicle and trying to find him. We're very grateful for everyone's cooperation in that. Thank you. Um, again, 
before I answer questions, let me say that probably the one person, the one group I didn't think is the, the media as well. I mean, all the coverage that we got on this certainly generated a tremendous amount of number of leads for us, and y'all been been uh, very good and helpful in, in that. So, with that, if you'll raise your hand, don't yell at me. If you raise your hand, I'll try to get to everybody. Understand that if you know you want, if they've got something for them, please wait. They'll be up here after me. So, go ahead. Sheriff, now that he is in custody, what do you want to happen to Ethan Couch this time around? Well, I'd like for him to be held accountable, as I've said all along. I don't think 10 years probation was, was appropriate for for killing four innocent people and driving at three times the legal limit of alcohol in his blood. So, you know, I, along with the DA, are going to be very hopeful that the case is transferred into an adult court. He is now an adult in the eyes of the state, and I would like to see him put in an adult, adult prison and serve out the remainder of his 10-year sentence. And hopefully they will continue to investigate this, perhaps uh, be able to file an additional case on him for fleeing initially from the probation. Yes. Sure. Are you saying that Ethan and his mother drove the truck all the way to Puerto Vallarta, or was it left at the border? And also, is his father involved in any way? Our understanding right now is that he did. they did drive the truck down there. That's the information that we were told on different occasions. Uh, the investigation is ongoing, and we're not at all through yet. I will say that to this point, we haven't uncovered any information that the father is involved. And that's all I can say about that. We certainly haven't ruled it out, but at the same time, uh, all the work that we've done, uh, we've not seen any indication that he was involved in this to this point. Sure, you said that before they left, there was sort of a going away party. Can you talk a little bit about more? I, I don't know a lot to answer that question, to be honest with you. We were just told, as we, as we were trying to determine if this was premeditated as we believed it was, uh, a, a statement was made that they basically had a gathering before they left and you know, kind of characterized it as more or less a going away party, which to us meant that what we suspected had happened, that it was carefully planned and timed to get out of the country. So uh, that that was the important part of that. How it, who was there, how it happened, or where it was, I, I'm not familiar with. Yes, sir. But, Sheriff, just to be clear, you would you characterize this as a potential going away party involving family members? And you also mentioned that the brother may have been involved in some way in assisting them. Is that correct? No, I, I don't have any information about about. Okay. Anybody assisting? Sorry, maybe I misheard you then. But so the, the going away party did it involve family members? I, I don't know. I don't know who was there. Honestly, I don't. Yes, sir. Mr. Sheriff, uh, this going away party did this uh, happen after the discovery of this video purportedly showing Ethan at the uh, party where the beer pong was being played? Yeah, the, the, I, I think the timeline would show that. Obviously, it happened right before they left, and that they left after the, the video had surfaced. Jim. What kind of details can you share about the arrest itself? The arrest itself? Not really anything. I mean, it's not, you know, none of us were there, and it was carried out by the Mexican authorities, and so I, I really don't know other than that they supposedly stopped them in a, in a, in a roadway. I don't know any more about that. Yes, ma'am? Oh, so they were, they were driving in the As we understand. Again, you know, we're, we're just getting really third-hand information from, from Mexico about how it all they put out a statement this morning that you've probably seen that gave an intersection of where they supposedly arrested them, so I'm assuming that they were they were mobile at that point. Sheriff, where are they in Mexico right now? In another city, in a special holding facility? And are you talking weeks or days until they'll be coming back here to Texas? Well, that's that's Rick's world about coming back, and, and, and you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't know, honestly, where they're being held, nor would we probably answer that at this point in time. In the mugshot that was released this morning, Ethan Couch's hair appeared to be dyed black. Do you think he was actively trying to alter his appearance to evade capture? I think that's the natural assumption you have to make if you look at that photograph. And we certainly talked numerous times during the investigation that we believed that they would do everything they could to change their appearance. And so when you see the photo of him, he certainly tried. It was certainly easily recognizable. It didn't, didn't seem to work too well. I don't think anybody would have not recognized him, but his, his hair was markedly different, markedly darker, so I think that was obviously probably an attempt to, to, uh, to change his appearance. Phil? Do we know anything about their movements in Mexico, where they stayed, how they got their resources, how they were spending? There's a lot of work still going on on that. Obviously, we, during the investigation, there was, there was 
uh, references made and things like that, but nothing that we can we can talk about at this point. We're gonna we're gonna keep working on a lot of that. Sheriff, now that he has been captured, what do you want to tell the victims' families? Well, I just want to tell them that we we have done everything humanly possible to to bring justice to them and their loved ones. And as I said many times, I don't think initially that justice was served, and we hope now justice will be served. And as I had no control over what happened the first time, now we have really no control over what happens now. It's in the hands of the judicial system, which in our opinion didn't work well the first time. But we certainly think this time, hopefully, that, that, that justice will be served. And I will tell the families that, you know, for the sheriff's office and all of us here today, we did everything humanly possible. And you're looking at three sleep-deprived people who have been working on this around the clock pretty much trying to make this happen. And so we're, they're grateful, I'm sure. I haven't talked to any of them yet, but I know with what was said earlier that they're going to be very relieved that he's going to be back. Sheriff, sure, I know you said there's not much you can say in terms of the, the tips that came in, but generally, can you give us a sense of were these just tips that people saw them on a the street, or was this tips generated from people close to them within their circle of, of, of friends and family? I would say both of those are generally correct. I mean, there are people that knew them that we talked to that gave information. There were people, I mean, dozens and dozens of calls of sightings, you know, many of which were erroneous, but, but they were people that thought they saw them somewhere. So uh, we certainly had our share of those, but also people that had valuable information that, that were able to share it with us. Sheriff, you said this was, they had this planned out, this was well intended. It sounds like they were planning into running to run, I mean, I guess forever, because this office, none of these offices were going to let this drop, right? No, and I think that was a message that we tried to send out very strongly. And when I was asked during the investigation if, you know, what would what would happen if we couldn't find him, and I said then he's going to have a long life unable to return to his to his home. I mean, he would he would have not literally not been able to come back to America because I don't care how long he was gone. The, the warrant would have stayed out for him, and when he tried to cross back in, he would have been arrested. So he was at, at best looking at a life of exile. He was no way that he could come back to Texas or the states for that matter. So at, at some point, we felt like if he stayed gone long enough, knowing the way they are, they'd try to get back here, and hopefully that would be an opportunity to take him, and take him into custody. But it didn't last that long, nor did we think it would with the amount of tips and publicity we had generated. I felt like that. They, they find him, and they did. Do you think he crossed before the warrant was issued uh, across the border? And uh, did he, I mean, how do you think he's able to cross to Gainesville or what's he able to cross in Well, I don't, I, I don't know. You know, typically crossing over from here to Mexico is not a not a difficult thing to do. You know, the, the United States doesn't check people going out with the country. They check people coming into the country. So I don't think there would have been any any issue or problem with with uh, them getting out at that point, particularly since it was before any any pickup order or detention order was issued. Sheriff, you've been very vocal in expressing your anger about the situation. What would you say about Tanya Couch and as a mother allegedly helping her son evade capture? What does what do you think about her role in all this? I'm not the least bit surprised, to be honest with you. I mean, we saw the actions of, of how she acted when the initial uh, offense occurred. We saw how she acted throughout the trial. Her entire focus has been on protecting Ethan. Her entire focus has been on making sure he didn't see any justice done, making sure he was not accountable. So for her to assist him, I felt like was just a natural next occurrence. When he was gone and they said she was gone, I was absolutely not the least bit surprised. And I wasn't surprised that they were found together. I'm not surprised that she helped him. And I just think if you've seen the depositions of that civil suit, when she's asked questions about the last time she disciplined and the last time, I mean, there's just no, no chance that she will, she will ever think he needs to be punished or held accountable. Yes, was he seeing it as a door, or what can you say about their accommodations in Mexico? I, I don't know anything about that. I really don't.
Well, we're looking at everything right now, and that's just, that's just about all I can say about that. Uh, you know, I don't know that anybody there uh, was was absolutely aware of what what was getting ready to take place, but you know, from from the discussion of the gathering, it, it more or less was that. So we're going to continue looking at everything, and, and I I don't know that there'll be any further charges filed. If we come across something, we definitely will pursue it because we're going to be as aggressive as we can with this. What was the father's reaction when you told him, or when your office told him about the arrest? Or the Whose reaction? Uh, the father's. Uh, Mr. Oh, I, I haven't. He, he wasn't on my list. I didn't call him. Was he helpful at all? <clears throat> he was cooperative, as I've said. When we interviewed him, he was cooperative. Didn't really uh, give any information. Claimed he didn't really know anything. So uh, to say that he was helpful or led us any direction, I don't think so. But he was certainly cooperative and answered our questions. Just said he hadn't heard anything, hadn't heard from them, and didn't have any idea where they were. Is that? Hold on. Uh, what's the, I don't know who did speak to this, but the process of getting the couches back to the states. How long yeah. will that take? What's that going to? I'll, I'll, I'll let Rick talk about that in just a minute. Yeah, that's your okay. Yeah. Does this look like the kind of thing where they would have had to stash a lot of cash ahead of time to pull off something like this for this long? Obviously, I think. I don't know, and that's the honest answer, but obviously I think that was their intent, was to try not to leave a, a trail of, of you know, credit cards and things like that. So I think they were probably living a cash existence from, from what we believe, but again, that's, you know, that's just speculation at this point. Yes, sir. Given everything that has happened, you know, with uh, the, re the uh, discovery of the video at the party and the uh, going away party and, their, uh, and Ethan changing his appearance, in the eyes of law enforcement, does this remove any doubt that the uh, guy in the beer pong video is indeed Ethan Couch? Does that remove any doubt whatsoever? Uh, you know, I don't know that we could say that with any you know, with any absolute certainty. We certainly all suspected that was him. I still suspect that was him. That hasn't been proven in any way, shape, or form that I know of. So, you know, I, I'm not prepared to say absolutely it was him. It certainly certainly looked a lot like him. and, and some information we got from people was that he was there, so that's all I can say about that. Mr. Taylor. I just again like to echo uh, the statement that the uh, sheriff made about the media. We really appreciate the uh, media's involvement with this and pushing this out uh, nationally. It did, definitely did help in the investigation. So I'll start over here. Questions? Uh, as far as did you guys have any marshals in Mexico, or was it complete Mexican authorities that were able to apprehend the family? We have a, an office in Mexico City. We have uh, officers there, or deputies there in that office. Um, and can you can explain to us a little what the paperwork is in Mexico to extradite him here to back to Texas? Well, there's different ways that they'll do that, and we're not sure yet how they're going to do that, but my understanding is they're treating them as undesirable. They do not have any legal status in Mexico. He's not facing any charges for any violations in Mexico, just that he's wanted in the U.S. Not to my knowledge. Correct. Right. He wouldn't be extradited, so to speak, he'd be deported. Uh, depending on how they do that, yeah, it would be. It, they're going to probably expel him, but we don't we don't know that yet. And would your office fly him back, or the, what, the transportation of logistics on that other thing? Uh, well, we don't talk about the logistics of that kind of thing uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, and we don't know when and, and where. But uh, we, when we have that information, you know, obviously we'll, we'll act on. Could you just kind of sum up again the time and the manpower that was focused on this case? Well, we, we got on the case about 11 days ago. Um, it's, as far as quantifying the number of people, the hours, I mean, we worked day, daily on this case. Um, there's a large group of people and uh, resources that were leveraged for this investigation. Um, I wouldn't say that it was out of the ordinary for any other type of fugitive investigation. Uh, we leveraged like resources for the same. Um, but yeah, there was a commitment involved in it. Um, obviously because of the media attention that, w that was with behind it, uh, helped with a little bit of that, but uh, um, standard investigation. And his status right now is he is in Mexican custody? He is in Mexican custody, correct. Is he in Puerto Rico? Uh, I do not know the location of where they are. You mentioned, uh, or I know you can't get into details of the investigation, but the prosecutor's office down in the state of Jalisco in Mexico has said that they got involved on Saturday. Um, was he under surveillance since Saturday? I don't know the details of 
the, the actual workings of what happened down there, but uh, that seems about right with the timeline. That he was under surveillance? No, that the Mexican authorities were actively working uh, in that area at that time. Was the arrest, or did they uh, offer any resistance as they were being arrested, or was this without incident? I have no information to that. I mean, every fugitive investigation is different. Some we catch right away, some take years. Um, I think, uh, you know, we talk about fugitives, right? Fugitives, it's not easy being a fugitive. Um, it takes a, a mental and a physical toll on a person. Uh, paranoia potentially could set in. They get very comfortable in some instances. And there's also a sense of arrogance that they're invincible. Uh, it depends on what uh, state of mind that they, they take. But ultimately, those states of mind cause them to make mistakes. Uh, and, and that's not to say that they made mistakes in this case. Every fugitive makes mistakes. Um, but when they make those mistakes, we're going to leverage that. And, uh, and we do that in this investigation as, in this as well as we do in others. Were the tips that were coming in, were they all over the world, or were they kind of focused on Texas and Mexico? Uh, primarily, they were in the United States. Uh, we did receive some that were international. Um, you know, a lot of tips are you know, nothing, there's nothing behind them. And uh, some of them, very few, are something that you can pursue. Um, but no, they came from everywhere. You guys were offering a reward. Did one of those tips lead to his arrest? So will somebody get that reward? Uh, well, we're still working through that to see if that's gonna be the case. In the two weeks or so that they were missing, were they moving around or were they on one place? Uh, we don't know that. Do they had a further plan beyond staying Their, their plan or not. When uh, they were searching, they noticed that his passports and mom's passports were missing. Were those used in getting into Mexico? Do we know? Uh, not to my knowledge. Do you have a current warrant for uh, Honda County? I believe the, uh, the, the county, Tarrant County does, yes. The Marshal Service does not. It's a state warrant to obtain the apprehension. Can you tell us what? What, what mistakes did they make? You think that led to them being caught? You know? Well, we don't like to, to talk about those types of things, but uh, it's safe to say that every fugitive makes mistakes. So that these these fugitives were no exception. Did they change their names, uh, like register, whatever they were I don't know what names that they had in possession at the time of the arrest. I'm not aware. And from that mugshot, uh, we saw that uh, Ethan Couch apparently <coughs> tried to alter his appearance. Did his mother try to alter her appearance? I have not seen any photos to indicate that. I've heard just through media sources that they, she apparently made some attempt to uh, alter her appearance, but I haven't seen that. Uh, obviously, in the photo that you saw of Ethan, he did attempt to do that, and that's that's not uh, that's that's typical. I mean, they a lot of fugitives try to do that. They'll cut facial hair, they'll grow facial hair, dye their hair, try to change their appearance, but. Uh, I think it's safe to say that it didn't really work that much. So. Thank you. Yes. Um, you're talking about trying to get this case moved to adult court. Yes. Does that have to happen before, by a certain point? Or is that a difficult process? It's a hearing in juvenile court. It has to happen before his 19th birthday. We've gone ahead and filed the petition. Uh, to move his probation to adult court um, and the hearing for that was already set and it's January the 19th. It's up to a juvenile judge to make that determination. Yes. And if the judge makes that determination then, would the transfer happen then or would it happen upon his birthday? It happens on his birthday um, and that would, his, his probations would transfer on his birthday to the adult court. And we are still bound by the original sentence. Yes. And can you hold him out there at uh, Kimbo? Or would he need to be in an adult jail? Is he too old to be out there with other juveniles? Um, when he gets back, we'll be having uh, the juvenile judge will be having a detention uh, hearing to decide whether or not he should be held. We expect and would hope that the judge would hold him. 
The judge can hold him either in the juvenile detention facility or transfer him to the adult jail. Given his age, we are hoping that he'll be transferred to the adult jail. Then it'll be up to the sheriff as to what portion of the jail he should be in, given that he has um, been a flight risk. Um, perhaps he'll be in a uh, more secure area of the jail. Yes? You, um, the, the, the hearing, if he's going to go to the juvenile detention for as much as four months, if... The if he stays in juvenile, if he stays in the juvenile court, the maximum sentence he could receive is incarceration in a juvenile facility until he turns 19, which is April the 11th of 2016. That is not enough. The alternative is for his case to be transferred to the adult court, and that means his probation's transferred to the adult court, not a sentence. Of, we're bound by the original sentence. Does that make sense? So his probation's would transfer to the adult court. So does that mean after he does the four months possibly in juvenile detention, would it have to be a whole new set of charges for him to serve in adult jail? It's either or. He either, in Texas, he either gets the juvenile sentence till he's 19, or we move him to adult court. I'm not satisfied with four months in a juvenile facility. We're asking for him to be moved to adult court. The difference for him in adult court is, as long as he's in juvenile court in Texas, the standard is the best interest of the child. In adult court, he'll be treated as an adult. And in criminal law in the state of Texas, we're interested in the safety of our community and the appropriate punishment for defendants. Uh, Madam DA, uh, isn't the defense attorney going to argue that this is nothing more than simply a probation issue and the penalty shouldn't be excessive? Wouldn't the uh, defense attorney argue that? Sure. Yes. What effects will happen to him when he gets with his probation? Will there be any? If his adult probation, if his probation is transferred to adult court, this incident of fleeing would be before the transfer to adult court? So it wouldn't be the subject of a revocation in adult court. That's, the, that's kind of the horns of the dilemma. He actually gets to start over with his 10-year probation or the remainder of it, so about eight years probation in adult court, but he will be supervised by adult probation officers and be held accountable by adult district court judges. Um, and for, for us, that makes a big difference because remember, while he was supervised by juvenile, it was several days before we were even notified that he was gone. So we want out of the juvenile system for this defendant and into the adult system. Yes, sir. Is there sir? any justice or sentencing advantage to slow walking back from Mexico to where he doesn't return here until he's 19 years old? Uh, no. <laughs> how, much is this, how much does this situation infuriate you? How does it infuriate me? How much? How much? Um, well, do I seem infuriated? <laughs> um, I don't even know how to answer that. You do seem very infuriated. That's why well, I hope I seem businesslike. Um, I hope that I seem like I recognize the seriousness of this man's misconduct and his mother's misconduct, and I hope that I sound like uh, we're ready to deal with that when he gets here. I wish the system were different. However, our system of law in Texas means that the best result in this case is going to be to get him, in our opinion, into the adult court. And tell us That's again, Tanya Couch, uh, you mentioned the 2 to 10 for, for the possibility we guys pursue the We maximum. expect to charge her with hindering apprehension, and that is a third degree felony in Texas that carries a range of punishment of 2 to 10 years in the penitentiary. You want the full 10 years for her? Um, I think she deserves to be incarcerated. And what other charges are you looking at him for? Hang on. No, I'm still trying to get clear. So since his probation violations happened under juvenile, mm -hmm. when he comes back, it starts at zero. So even if he's transferred to adult court. He unless, starts at zero in adult court. Okay. That means he's not going to jail, right? That is because not necessarily true. Because when his probation is transferred to adult court, an adult court judge in Texas has the ability, especially on a, on a charge of involuntary manslaughter, which is what his case is, to sentence a defendant under our laws to 120 days in jail, which would be the adult jail, which would actually be a longer sentence than he would get if he were in the juvenile facility. But he would, after that jail time, be supervised for the remainder of his probation. Does that make sense? Yes. 
And you would expect them to have an ankle monitor as well as other um, everything that they can do. I will be asking for every single possible condition of probation where we will know where he is at all times. So are you saying that the most that he could be behind bars is only 120 days? As a condition of probation. If he violates his adult probation, he could be looking at 10 years on each death, which we would ask the court to stack, which is a potential of 40. So when he comes back, we're going to be expecting Ethan Couch not to violate the terms and conditions of his adult probation because there will be severe consequences, which he has not had to face yet. Wait a second. Yes, okay, ma'am. So just to be clear, if he gets transferred into the adult system, obviously he messes up again and violates his probation and gets punishment, but is there any new charge that you can bring against him in the adult court system for anything he's done in it occurred before his probation would have been received in adult court, so the answer is no. So, ma'am, just again, to be very <laughs> clear, he would have to mess up again in order for him to get those up to 40 years. Right now, he can only go to jail for 120 days? If we transfer him to adult court. If we leave him in juvenile court, he'll get less than that, and he'll be in a juvenile facility. So, it is the horns of a dilemma of Texas law. So he can either stay in juvenile and get incarcerated from January till April the 11th when he turns 19 in a juvenile facility, or we can move him to adult court and an adult judge can, can instate his or enforce his 10-year probated sentence that was given him before, which means he'd be on an additional eight years probation. And as a condition of that probation, the adult judge has the authority to sentence him to jail time as a condition of probation and that 120, jail, 120 days in jail that he could receive on his adult probation is actually longer than he would get if he stayed in the juvenile system. So I hope that that explains to you why we severely, seriously, want him moved to the adult court. And a lot of people around the country are going to look at the fact that he's given any other chance again, and they're going to find that very hard to believe. What would you say to those people? Um, I would say that this is the law in the state of Texas. We know the law, we're following the law, and we're trying to get an appropriate sentence for him. We are, however, bound by the original judgment of the juvenile judge that gave him 10 years probation. Yes, sir. There's a new judge in the juvenile court now. That's correct. Do you feel better with him, with this hearing? The standard of law in juvenile court is best interest of the child. We want Ethan Couch into adult court. Um, I am, he will be making that determination on the detention hearing, and, you know, I, you know, we'll see. I don't, you know, I don't have opinions about whether you think this judge is good or bad. That's not what we do. This is the law. This is what we're doing. Yes. Assuming, let's, let's say the judge doesn't transfer it to adult court, he, and the judge puts him in jail until April 11th, his birthday, at that point, if he's still in, in the a juvenile case, would he he would be released on, on his birthday? He would be released then, on his birthday. And then he would continue to serve out whatever however left how much is left on that probation? No. He would not he would no longer be on probation. He could be on parole. It's a different well, But that but that that's, that seems that seems even even crazier. Okay, let me start with, I don't write the law. <laughs> <laughs> I understand it, and we're not smart enough to really understand it either. So, <laughs> the, uh, uh, April 11th comes, he's still considered a juvenile. No, on April the 11th, well... Uh, uh, assu assuming he's not transferred, let's just assume he's, he's still in juvenile court. April 12th, everything just goes away? He'll be released from juvenile custody when he turns 19. I heard somebody say April 10th. Did I have his birthday wrong by day? No. Um, so he'll be released on April the 11th when he turns 19. He could be supervised by adult pro, uh, parole at that time. We prefer, and it's a choice that I will be making as the district attorney, we prefer to try to get him to adult court. That's what we're asking for. The juvenile judge gets to make the decision, and that'll be that hearing on January the 19th in juvenile court. What else? Yes, so sir. Ultimately, right now, then, his fleeing is not going to cost him anything other than a juvenile detention hearing. He'll be in jail. Well, 
the short answer is yes, under the law, that's correct. Until April 11th. So, and, and if he, if his case is moved after this hearing, January 19th, January 19th, or January, in January, if it's moved to adult court, mm -hmm. then one what? of the adult judges will take over the probation that he was already given by the juvenile judge. We are bound by the sentence he received from the juvenile judge in 20, I think it's February of 2014. It was adjudicated in December of 2013, and he received the probated sentence in February of 2014. But then he would stay in jail, and forgive me for staying on this, it's just no, trying fine. to understand. But if that were transferred to the adult court in January, mm -hmm. and the adult court, the adult judge then has this case, his fleeing, what effect would that have? His fleeing occurred prior to him being placed in adult court, and so it cannot be the basis of a motion to revoke his adult probation. Does that make sense? So he would leave jail when? Well, when he got transferred to adult court, the adult judge, as a condition of probation, can sentence him up to 120 days in the jail. So either way, he's getting out of jail sometime in the next four months. Five, four or five months or so. I, in, in the scenarios that I understand under the law, yes. And he would have to mess up again in order to be in jail for After that. years. After that. He would have to violate the terms and conditions of his adult probation yeah, after the 120 days, which is what we're going to be asking for. So yes, he would have to have a new violation of his terms and conditions of adult probation. If he did, then we have the authority under Texas law for him to receive 10-year sentences for those violations and for the judge to stack those violations. Yes? How badly do you want this law to be changed to make this, you know, more, to make more sense and to be more, to serve justice better since this seems confusing and, and well, I mean, we can have a philosophical discussion about changing laws, but I don't think you change laws for one case. But that's philosophical, and that's what we have as legislators, and I'm not one of them. Yes. So what's your message to Judge Gene Boyd, who sentenced him to just 10 years juvenile probation, uh, when almost every single person on the face of the planet says that that was a very light sentence? I don't have a message. I believe that she did what she thought was right at the time. I disagree, but that's why she made that determination. Yes. Sorry, one more scenario. He's transferred into adult. Right. Let's say he's held as a juvie in, in jail until April 11th. Then he, if, if he were to be transferred to the adult system on April 11th, and and the adult judge decides to hold him for 120 days. We'll be asking the judge as condition of probation to give him 120 days in jail. So theoretically, could he be in jail from now until uh, April, May, June, July, mid-August? Theoretically. That's your best case scenario. That would be the best case scenario as far as I can see it. And then, okay. he, would, and then he would be released and then put on probation for the rest of, for the, rest of the, the time. Right, for the remainder of that period okay. of time. Okay. Yes? On adult probation, what are conditions that, that he could violate? I mean, I know there would be a total line of conditions, but well, what are some simple things that a person could do wrong and then go back to prison? Um, adult probation, the terms and conditions are set out in 4212. Uh, number one is you don't violate the terms and conditions of probation, which is you have to work full time at suitable employment. You can't, you cannot violate the laws of the state of Texas. Um, you have to have whatever education the judge requires. There are specific conditions that are allowed for convictions for involuntary manslaughter, which include deep lung devices on any vehicles that the person drives to make sure that they're not driving while intoxicated. So there are some specific laws and conditions under 4212 for these specific kinds of crimes. But the regular terms and conditions of probation would apply. And then whatever else the judge crafted. Keep in mind that while we may ask for certain terms and conditions of probation, it is the judge's decision, our adult judge's decisions, what those terms and conditions are. We're very comfortable with them making that decision. Yes? Does the beer pong video hold up at all with him not It predates his adult probation, and it's interesting. Anyway. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Okay, Thank quick. you. Thank Any you. possibility of federal charges? Uh, in this? Rick? Any, Rick? Any, any?
any possibility of any federal charges? Not at this time. Let me say one more thing, and then <clears throat> we're going to stop, and uh, I'll be around if you need to do anything individual. I don't know what their schedules are like. Um, <clears throat> thanks again for all of y'all. Let me say, I know I've already been asked 20 times about what's going to happen when we get them back as far as what y'all are going to be able to do. I mean, I just want you to understand that we're not going to talk about publicize releasing the information about their return due to the security aspect of it. So, uh, you know, please just understand that we're going to work with the Marshal's Office. And uh, once we have them here in custody and locked up in the, in the, in the appropriate facilities, then we'll let you guys know that, that we have them, but we're not going to do any kind of uh, situation where we're going to put them on display or let, let people know when they're coming in or where we will have them. Okay? Thank you all for being here. <coughs> So again, all these <laughs> <laughs> So we don't only